Uh, as Rich said, uh, this paper is entitled uh, Valuing MPI Message Size Summary Statistics. Uh, a more pointed title for this paper might be uh, why we should stop using the, the arithmetic mean when we discuss likely MPI message sizes. Um, uh, this is work done with uh, a colleague at Sandia, uh, Scott Levy. Uh, we're all virtual, so there's our pictures. Uh, Scott's looks a bit like a mugshot, but he's smiling, so I'm assuming it's not a mugshot. Um, if I can't hold your attention uh, for the full talk, uh, here's a summary. Uh, in this work, we're uh, showing that the average or the mean, while being easy to calculate and efficient to calculate, it may not be a very good representation for all the subsets of the application message size data. And we also show that the mean and the mode may be a superior choice in most cases. Um, the, the problem with using the mean or the average relates to the multimodal nature of the distribution of point-to-point -point messages, which I'll be showing you shortly. Uh, we also we also show that uh, scaling seems to have little discernible impact on which of these uh, central tendency metrics, like the mean, uh, which of them. Uh, are good representatives of the underlying data. However, uh, changing input descriptions for some of our apps can significantly can significantly impact which of those metrics uh, is the best choice. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, so the the overarching goal here. Uh, is that we're trying to be a little more principled about how we talk and disseminate and analyze uh, MPI data. Specifically for this talk, we're talking about MPI message data. And so our goal here is to provide some guidance. So is how should we be discussing it? How should we be analyzing it? How should we be disseminating that information? Um, First, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to be using some terminology. This terminology is likely um, uh, obvious and known to everyone, but just so we have an even playing field here, uh, uh, these are different measures of central tendency. First here is the mean. Um, that's a pretty uh, standard metric. You take all of your data points, sum them up, and divide by the number of data points. Uh, the median is the middle value in your sorted data set. So there's a little cartoon there that shows a bunch of data. If we sort it and take the, the middle value, that's the mean, uh, which in this case is nine. Uh, the mode is the most common value in the data set. Uh, so again, in the cartoon, we see the mode is nine. It's the one that occurs most frequently. We have a uh, we're also going to be looking at a number of variants on the arithmetic mean. Uh, the first is the harmonic mean. Generally, the harmonic mean is used in situations when an average, when you're looking for an average rate, the formula is shown there. Um, there's a geometric mean. Uh, generally, the, the geometric mean is appropriate for situations when you're comparing items with different numeric ranges. It can sort of normalize that range for you. There's a root mean square, which is also called a quadratic mean. This is generally used in electrical engineering. And lastly, what we're going to be looking at is called the tri-mean. Uh, the tri-mean is a weighted average of the median value in this formula, which is Q2. And then we take the upper and lower quartiles, and we sum, sum all that up and divide uh, by four. Uh, the trimene is generally more robust to outliers because we're using uh, quartiles. Okay, so I'm going to try to present this problem in the same to you in the same way that Scott and I saw. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a probability distribution function of message size for an application we care about at Sandia called CTH. The exact details of CTH are not really pertinent to this discussion as a shock physics code. Um, 
Uh, this is, uh, in this plot, the y-axis is the probability density. So if you have more messages, the probability density is higher. Um, the x-axis is the size of the message that, that you send. Uh, you'll notice here that I'm, I'm displaying the probability density as sort of a continuous function. It is, of course, discrete. Uh, because we can't, we only send discrete message sizes. For some of the apps that I'll be showing, uh, there are export control issues, and fuzzing this data in this way is an effort to protect um, uh, release, basically. Uh, so Scott and I were looking at this data. We plotted all of the probability density of all the message sizes for CTH. Um, and then we noticed something which we, we put the mean and we noticed that the mean seems to uh, sit in this trough, this trough of the probability density. Uh, it's about 800K in this case uh, is the mean message size. And so that made us think um, for applications we care about, is the mean a good representation? I mean, we've seen the mean in many publications, and so we thought to ourselves, we wanted to investigate, is the mean really the right metric, and or should we be using a different metric? Um, so, uh, taking a step back a bit, so I showed you, uh, I showed you this message data. This, these were previously collected. Got this data from previously collected and validated message traces. Uh, we have a bunch from uh, a number of key scalable production workloads and proxy applications. These traces were collected using the LobGopsim framework uh, from the folks at ETH. Uh, I think it's important to note that this analysis includes all explicit MPI messages. As many on the call are aware, uh, there are some functions within MPI that may do some implicit messaging, I believe, uh, for example, creating a new communicator, they have to uh, uh, send her on a con agree and send her on a context ID. Uh, those th that data, all the implicit messaging, is not included in the in the analysis. Uh, it's only explicit uh, MPI messaging. Um, <coughs> pardon. Uh, the data is tagged in such a way that. Uh, we can perform analysis on subsets of the data. For example, we can look at collectives, point-to-points, individual MPI functions, uh, functions, et cetera. Uh, so we need, we need a metric to evaluate the, the efficiency of these central tendency me uh, metrics. So we need some way of saying, for example, the mean is a good or poor metric for this underlying data, or the median is better. We had a number of choices, and what we, cho what we chose to go with is um, a metric called the median absolute uh, deviation. I'll refer to it as MAD. Um, there's a formula there on the screen for it. It's, it's fairly straightforward. What you're essentially doing to generate the MAD of a certain central tendency metric is you take the median of the difference of all values within the distribution from that central tendency metric. Um, so we, we take all the differences and then we find the median, uh, the absolute median of that difference. Uh, informally, th this mat is essentially a, a measure of the statistical dispersion of the data set around some central tendency. Um, and we chose the mat over a number of available metrics, for example, like the standard deviation, because within statistics, the MAD is known to be a more robust uh, and resilient statistic uh, to outliers. There's a number of workloads that we considered. Um, uh, LAMPS, uh, which is a molecular dynamics code. LULESH, which is a hydrodynamics code. There's a number of proxy apps like HPCG, which is a, um, a, a conjugate gradient. I, I already showed you some data for CTH, which is a shock physics code we care here at Sandia. Uh, another proxy app, MiniFE, which is a um, implicit finite element analysis code. And lastly, Spark, which is another Sandia code um, 
that is a compressible a fluid dynamics code. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm only going to be discussing a subset, uh, LAMP, CTH, Mini FE, and Spark. Uh, you'll see we, there's general trends for all of these apps. I refer you uh, take a look at the paper. Uh, there are more details uh, within there. Um, okay, so here I'm showing you the probability distribution function again, but I'm showing it for a number of applications, uh, CTH, LAMP, Spark, and Mini FE. Uh, and the mean is uh, signified by that dollared yellow line. Um, and what we can see, we see from this that this, um, this, uh, the mean seems to be a poor represent representation for most of the workloads that, that we're, that we've looked at. Uh, it sits in this trough. Um, so I'm going to look a little closer at CTH. Um, so, okay, I'm showing you a different figure. This I'm showing you is a plot of the, the median deviation, the median absolute deviation or the MAD. Um, the the y-axis is that value. A lower value signifies a better fit. Uh, and note that the y-axis is log in this case. Um, the the x-axis here is the message population. So to your farthest left, you'll see all of the messages accumulating. And then I break it. And then as I move right, I break it apart to just point to points and just collectives. Uh, and the different bars are signifying the MAD calculation or the fitness for that metric uh, against these other central tendency metrics that I discussed. Uh, so there's the blue is median, what looks like orange. I mean, sorry, the blue is the mean, what looks like orange is the median green uh, mode, red is the tri mean. Um, the geometric mean is purple, then brown is the root mean square, which is the uh, 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 quadratic mean, and then um, uh, purple is the, the tri mean. Um, okay, so I think a few things to note. First, looking at all of the messages, we see that the mean and the median have significantly lower values, lower MAD values. So what this is saying is this is saying that the mean, in this case for CTH, the median and the mode have significantly low, or have a much, or a much better representation than the mean, that large blue line, um, for the CTH message data for all messages. Uh, and if we look at point to points and collectives, we see the same thing, that uh, the median and the mode have a better fitness and therefore appear to be a better metric for describing uh, um, the underlying messages for CTH. One thing that is important to note, um, well, a few things that are important to note is uh, if we look at the fitness for the arithmetic mean for the point to points versus collectives, uh, we see that for collectives, the the fitness for the arithmetic mean is significantly lower. In fact, it's on par with the fitness for the median for point to points. And so, we wanted to look at why that might be. Uh, so I'm showing you, again, this is CTH, I'm showing you the probability distribution functions, but I'm breaking apart point to points, which is on the upper left, and collectives, which is not very interesting, on the upper, on the lower right. Uh, not surprisingly, the, um, the point to points have a much more diverse set of message sizes. The collectives, there's most of the collectives being sent by CTH are small, um, and then we have a number of very few larger collectives that don't really show up, and they're mainly from things like all to alls, uh, that it, it doesn't really show up well in the probability distribution function. Um, therefore, so this is a this is a positive point. This is saying that for point to points, you probably don't want to mean you won't want to use a mean as a 
summary statistic when you talk about data, but for collectives, because uh, there's a much lower diversity of size, a mean may be okay. Uh, another thing to note that you may have noticed is that uh, the point to point, the shape of the probability, probability distribution function for CTH for all messages and point to points is essentially the same. Uh, that distribution is, is, is being run by the point to point sizes and not the collectives. Okay. So, uh, uh, the results that we see that the median and the mode, um, uh, are better representatives. We generally see across all the applications we tested. Uh, I'm showing here CTH lamps, Spark and Mini FE. And again, this is a plot of the fitness. If you have a higher value, uh, you, your metric is not as effective of a representative of, of the underlying data. Uh, the closest we, so for CTH, Spark and Mini FE, we see that the difference between uh, the median um, and, and the mean is quite significant. For lamps, uh, the difference, so we're comparing the blue and the orange bars for each of these plots, essentially. There's a large orders of magnitude difference for most of the apps. For lamps, it's within an order of magnitude, but the median is still. Uh, so yeah, the mean tends to be a poor representative for all these apps. Uh, the median and in some cases, the mode is a better representative. Uh, and similarly to what we saw in CTH, for collective, if we compare point to points and collectives, um, the median, the, the absolute difference, the mad value for the mean for collectives may be, is much lower and therefore, uh, the mean may be a reasonable metric for collectives, but it doesn't appear to be for point to points for anything that we tested. Okay, so uh, let me try to summarize uh, what I've shown so far. So what, uh, what you've seen so far is that uh, the dispersion for the, for the arithmetic mean and its variance uh, in message size data, if you're looking at all the apps, the dispersion is quite large and the median and the mode uh, are generally better metrics. Uh, the dispersion is lower. But for each of the plots I've shown you, I've only shown you one specific uh, node count. And so we wanted to look at some additional questions, which is uh, as we scale, do we have to consider different metrics or do the metrics change, stay the same? And also, if we're looking at different problems within an application, uh, do those metrics that are the best representatives stay the same? Uh, so first, looking at scaling. So there's two kinds of scaling, as many are aware of, and I always mess these up, but let's see if I'll get it right. Uh, for weak scaling, the work per node stays essentially the same. And because the work per node stays essentially the same, the message data distribution remains nearly exact. And, and therefore, we see no significant impact on the dispersion. And so essentially, that says um, that the metric, as we, if we weak scale, the metric that is the best representative, likely the median, um, it, it, it should stay valid as the, the best representative. For strong scaling, which is the overall problem size stays the same, but the node count changes, the point-to-point -point distribution does likely change. The, the message size and the point-to-points does likely change. And so we have to look at that um, and see uh, what, uh, what is the fitness of each, each of these metrics? So what I'm showing you here is the, um, the MAD value plots for three, um, uh, three node counts for mini FE, 64, 128, 256. These are the same kinds of graphs. Um, the mean is in blue. I think the most important part is the mean is in blue and the uh, median, excuse me, the median and the mode are in orange and green. 
Uh, again, I break it apart. This is a bit of an eye chart, but I think you can kind of see. Um, uh, break it apart by all points, points, and collectives. And what we see is um, for each node count for mini FE, the relative statistical dispersion remains uh, nearly the same. And therefore, um, scaling seem, appears to have little impact on which metric is the best representative. Uh, there's more details and other apps. We see this for other apps as well in the paper. I'll refer you to that in the interest of time. Uh, and then there's this other question. As I said, there's this other question that is, if we change application inputs, do we have to reconsider uh, which metric is is the is the the best metric? Uh, so I'm showing you here two different lamps potentials. On the left is Leonard Jones or LJ, uh, and on the right is Snap. Uh, which is more accurate quantum potential. Um, you'll note that the shapes of these distributions are nearly the same. Uh, what's important is the order of magnitude uh, of the 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 fitness. Um, there, there's an order. There's orders of magnitude difference uh, between the two inputs for lamps, the two input descriptions, and therefore. Um, there seems to be some sensitivity as to which metric is the same. I mean, in this case, the median uh, does appear to be a superior uh, metric for representing the underlying data, but it does suggest that for applications, as you change input, the, the best metric may change as well. Again, there are more details in the paper. I refer you to that in the interest of time. Um, okay. so. Uh, in an effort to wrap it up here. Um, our, our, our data shows that the arithmetic mean is not necessarily a good representative for underlying MPI message data. It's widely used. Uh, we understand why people are using it. It's, it's widely used. It's easily understood. It's very efficient to compute. You can uh, compute it with a limited amount of storage. Um, but the median and the mode are typically better choices because they have a lower dis, uh, dispersion. Um, the, there is a positive here in that we, we have been able to show that the mean is generally more useful when discussing more specific MPI operations, uh, like just collectives or specific collectives. Um, the, another thing that we've shown here is that non-traditional means uh, which are these variants on the arithmetic mean, like the tri mean or the harmonic mean or the geometric mean, generally perform a little better than the mean itself. Um, these, these means generally exist to filter out um, outlier data, but it, the outlier data is not typically the problem. It's this multimodal nature, which these uh, specific metrics don't do well against. We've also shown that scale typically does not have a significant impact on which metric is the best representative. However, the different inputs within an application can significantly impact the best metric. Therefore, the determination of uh, what metric to use uh, may change depending on uh, the target input of the problem. With that, I uh, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so we have time for a few questions. We're right on time. Uh, in, any questions? So I don't, uh, are, uh, are there any on the Slack channel at all? I don't see the Slack, Slack channel. Uh, looks like we've got one coming in. Okay. Or a couple of of them coming in. Okay. So one from uh, Benson: Might plots of the distribution of message sizes or polynomial fits to these be useful? Okay. Um, so I I'm going to interpret that question basically being uh, I'm going to interpret that question to be. Um, Maybe we can't, maybe we shouldn't be using one number 
to describe these distributions. We need more elaborate because these summary statistics are essentially trying to boil down all the message data into one number. Um, might there be a more effective way using multiple numbers? And I, I, and we think that's the way to go. I mean, if you're doing a polynomial fit, you're essentially representing with with additional data. Um, and I, I think that's probably the way to go. Is that um, uh, though easier to understand and easier to reason than analyze people have been using these single summary statistics, but something like a polynomial fit uh, or other summary statistics that that uh, incorporate more data is probably the best way to go. We haven't specifically looked at polynomial fit. Um, there, there's, there's likely some great value there because if, if you can fit to a certain polynomial, that might give you some properties uh, that you can exploit. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Okay. So, Wesley, there was a second one you were saying? Uh, looks like that might have been it for now. Okay. Well, thank you, Kurt.